morning to the going with us to the various media uh, outlets and forums. We're so glad to have you with us here at Obethel. Our prayer, our prayers, always that as you join in with us, God is speaking to you. God touches your heart. God moves in your life. That through the words you see, hear, the words you hear sung, those that are spoken, <laughs> God touches your life. So glad to have everybody here today. So glad to have everyone who can join in with us. May the Lord bless this hour as we gather together. We're going to be singing out of the Methodist Town Hall this morning. Turn to number 514. Stand up. Stand up for Jesus. So y'all got to stand. <laughs> Well, the Spirit of the Lord is. There is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God Be seated and turn to 575 onward, Christian soldiers. We'll sing the first, third, and fifth. <laughs>
say this morning's offering. Number 529. How firm a foundation.
you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading, I'll be reading from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, 11 through 32. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild, in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to the citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set, set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, and he threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his words. I am sure all of us know by now that school has ended. You can, you can hear the young people saying, thank you, Jesus. We have closed up our grade books, we've entered our grades, we've posted our grades, and now the, the, the good news or the bad news is, is gone out or will be going out very soon. At the end of every school year, I take some time to give my students an evaluation. Now this evaluation is an evaluation of me. They get to evaluate me. I hand this to my students and I tell them, fill this thing out truthfully. Do not put your name on it. If you do, I'm going to give you a zero. Do not put your name on it and fill it out truthfully. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. I can take it. Tell it like it is. I can handle it. Truthfully, I, I pretty much know before they give them back to me, how they're going to respond to most, if not all, of the, the questions. But I still want to hear from them. I want to know what a year or, or two years in my classroom has been like for them. Last week I received all of their response sheets and I reviewed every single one of them. Some of them even left me notes, so I actually know who they are, but they left me notes. And, and I was very proud. 
And then one student actually rated me as a fair teacher. That's the next to the lowest score you can possibly get as a teacher. And yet, I'm pretty sure he's coming back, so I'm looking for him. No, I'm kidding. There was one note, however, that I enjoyed as much as any of the others. It was on this particular question. The question is, the teacher maintains control of his classroom. One was, I strongly disagree. Goes all the way up to four, which says, I strongly agree. On this particular one, they circled four. And they wrote right out beside of it these words, or this word, definitely. With all the questions, of course, all the questions matter to me, but that one matters to me as, as much as any. The reason being is, is that I do all that I can in any way that I can to always be honest with my students. When I believe they choose well, I want to let them know it. When they choose poorly, I certainly let them know that as well. Sometimes it's just on an individual basis. Sometimes it is collective or a classroom basis. But I promise you this, I can say this truthfully, my students never have to wonder what I'm thinking. I've also discovered that apparently there is some look that comes over my face when they know they are on the brink of having dissatisfied their instructor. Or at least that's what they have told me. Now some folk kind of think the classroom is a sterile place where instruction is offered and children are encouraged to absorb it. And I, I suppose that may be true somewhere. But I don't really think that's true in, in my class. My classes are small. My students tell me things, sometimes things they know, but they're going to get that look over. Sometimes they know full well, I'm going to speak to it in a way that will not make it comfortable for them. Sometimes they tell me things I enjoy, I enjoy celebrating with them. I'm proud of them and for them and what they've done. As I said, I, I'm fortunate. Like, I usually have my students for two years running, all of it in a small group atmosphere. I don't have more than 16 students at a time and only have three classes. So we talk. We, we talk about life. We talk about good choices. We, we talk about bad choices as well. Most of the time, it's, it's all good. Sometimes it isn't all good. Sometimes it's completely joyful. And sometimes it's woefully disappointing. But we deal with it anyway. We deal with it truthfully. Sometimes meaningfully. I want them to understand. I want them to understand that I think of them almost the same way as I think of my own child. I want them to understand I'm proud for them when they, they do good. And I am not happy when you choose poorly, especially if you choose poorly while you're in my classroom. But at the end of the day, whether there are good choices or bad choices, I want them to understand and know in their hearts they still matter. I still care about them. I love them the way Christ has called me to love others. That is a personal goal that I have. And I look on those forms every year to see if, if I may have achieved it. Jesus tells the parable of a prodigal son. Here is a, is a father who, who loves his children, both of his boys. There is one that is always working to do good for his dad. 
the one that takes care of things, is the one that is conscientious and dutiful, a dutiful child pleasing his father is a very important thing to him. And then there is the one that seems to be a bit of a free spirit, a dreamer who believes that out there in the world there are, there are so many exciting things to explore and to see and to experience. The world is a lure to this one. He cannot wait to see what things are like beyond his dad's reach and his watchful eye. The things his father has done for him up to this time is is not really that much of value to him other than it will provide him with an, with an opportunity to hit the road, to, to live it up in ways that surely would not have met with his father's approval nor his expectations for him. Jesus goes on to tell us that the younger son got exactly what he wanted. He got his time out there in, in the world. And he learned pretty quick that the world will, will gobble you up and with it all that you, you have. It may be alluring looking in. But once you, once you are in, it's, it's kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. It can take away everything. It can take all you possess. Not just your money. But it can take away your dignity, your hopes, your dreams. It can leave you feeling empty and hungry. All the way down inside your soul. Jesus tells this story to his listeners. It seems he is he's teaching them that there are, there are choices to make. Sometimes humanity chooses, chooses wisely and, and other times it chooses poorly. And like it is with every choice, there are always going to be consequences. Sometimes good and sometimes bad. Not that, that God makes them bad, but because sometimes the consequences are bad all by themselves. You, you choose this road, road and it takes you to a, to a wonderful, glorious, and, and, and meaningful experience. Or you, you choose this road and it takes you an entirely different way. A way that is filled with want and worry or worse, defeated despair that leaves you thinking there may be no way out of this. Jesus wants his listeners to hear. There are always going to be people who will choose poorly. They will make a mess out of things. They will find themselves alone and hungry for something that, that matters. Our world is filled with people who are hungry for food from their father. Well, they... They may not admit it. In fact, they may be getting along just fine without it. At least, at least that's the way it looks like on the outside. But how many out there are still hungry even when they do not look like they are hungry? Hungry on, on the inside for, for the realization that they, they matter in this world to someone or to even the, that great someone who created them. We sometimes think, I'm afraid, that that people don't need that anymore, but I, I think that's a mistake. I think there is a real longing that all of God's children have. All of them need to believe that they matter and that their lives matter, and that they are indeed loved. Well, Jesus goes on to say that the unruly child finally comes to the realization that, that the world is, is not the, the best place for him. The best place for him is, is back at home with, with his father. The one who brought him into this world. The one who loved him even as he saw him uh, walking away from his home knowing he was about to choose poorly. I'm going back to my father, he said. He, he may have disowned me. I may have made a mess out of things. He may not even love me as his son anymore, but I'm going back. This is not the life for me. I was wrong. Isn't it good when someone chooses better? When someone at the very least begins their journey out of the world 
back home to the Father. Of course it's a wonderful thing. It's an always a wonderful thing. As a man or a woman begins to break the chains that bind them to this world. It's a joyful thing. Something to celebrate. This boy's daddy is thrilled. He's ready to throw a party to, to celebrate his son's returning to him. See, that's the way it is with God. Our God. You can choose poorly. But you still matter to the one above. You are still his child. He made you. He wants you home with him. He wants to remind you just how much he loved you then, just how much he loved you as, as he saw you walk away, just how much he loves you now that you want to come back home. Jesus teaches us that is the very way it is in the, in the kingdom of God. That is the way God works. God is compassionate, a compassionate father who sees his child from afar and in his heart is already warmed and and ready to celebrate his son return, his son's return. Well, that's, that's some really good stuff. That's, that's what Christ died for. While we make our way back up that dusty driveway to our Father, Jesus is celebrating too. Because he made all of it possible for us. Can't you just imagine the Father's thoughts? I don't think he's taken inventory of everything his son did wrong. I think the only thing that matters is he's coming home again. He's coming home to where he should be. I think that's, that's why he wants to celebrate. What a wonderful story of a redeeming, loving father. But alas, as we go further into the story, it all becomes too human again. Well, there's the, the older boy. You know, the boy, the boy that did everything right. The, the dutiful one, the one who showed up where he was supposed to be, the one who took care of things as an expression of his loyalty and devotion to his dad, the one who just about never disappointed his father. The one who was always there for his dad. The one who went to church on Sunday and made good grades at school, never got into trouble, never disappointed his father. The one who always conducted himself with, with respect. The one who thought more of his father than he did the things of the world. You know what the world had to offer. You know, that boy in the family. What? What? You, you killed the... The fatted calf for him? You never did that for me. I did everything right, just like you wanted me to. I devoted myself to you in every way. And there's nothing for me? No celebration? Not anything? Where is the justice in that, Daddy? Maybe he had a point. Maybe he had a point if God operated in a way in which he loved one son more than he loved the other, even the one who chose poorly. But the good news for us is God does not operate that way. He loves both of his boys. That's just the way it is with the Lord that we serve. So the father said to his son, son, you, you're going to get everything, I promise. Everything I have is, is yours. It's, it's going to be exactly as I told you it would be. I love you with all of my heart. But I love him too, and, and I'm glad he's back, and, and I want to celebrate it, and I would really appreciate it if you would too. In fact, the scriptures tell us he went out and pleaded with him to be happy at his brother's return. Sometimes I suppose it is in us to wish that those who made bad choices spend the rest of their lives paying for them in some way or another. 
especially if that someone isn't one of our own children. Sometimes I suppose it seems more gratifying to see someone live with the consequences of their actions, big or small, than to see them come home again. Sometimes I suppose we wish it would be just a little harder for, for all to be forgiven and, and go on like nothing ever mattered. I am human enough to have to confess. I have found myself thinking that was too easy after all they had done. But the Lord teaches us there is the world's ways and the Lord's way. And they simply are not the same thing. But the good news is, the good news is God's way. God's way gives us a message worth telling. A message that shouts out to the world and all those who find themselves living in it. All those who find themselves engulfed in it. All those who believe they are trapped in it. No matter who you are, you have a father. And though you may have left him, he still wants you to come home. You have a father who, because he loves you, wants to celebrate with you when you return to him. He is ready for you. And he's ready to throw a party. He even says that angels are going to get in on it and rejoice. That is a great message worth talking about. A great message for the world to hear. There are times when God's children are a source of joy. There are times when we are a disappointment to him. But there will never be a time that he will stop loving us. There will never be a time that we will not matter to him. There will never be a time when we can't go home again. That's the truth. The truth that Christ died for. The truth that is your inheritance. A truth that is always worth telling. A truth that children who make good choices celebrate. And a truth the children who make poor choices can always come home to. A wonderful message. God is definitely in control. Our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is page 526. We'll sing the first and third verse of 526. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. 